Hello, this is out of the blue comes Francis Zhu. I'm Francis, and welcome to my show. Hi, everyone. I'm so glad to be here with you. I'm so excited to introduce you to this. New broadcast out of the blue comes Francis Zhu. This is a show where I want to dive into the practical aspects of spiritual awakening. I want to invite friends to come join me on the show to have some very deep and insightful discussions,、um, share examples of our healing, be very very transparent, and. Most importantly, actually, to have fun together, because、mm. that's really the essence of what everything is about. To be able to tap into the present joy, the present、um, connected connectedness.、Um, so, welcome again. And today, I have my very special guest, David Hofmeister, here with me. Hi, David. <laughs> Hi, Francis. It's great <laughs> to be here. Yeah, I'm so excited to have you join me to start this this show together and、um, to tap into some topics and also to set a context for all the episodes that's to come.、Mm. So today, I really want to start this whole show with the topic of. Mysticism, mystical community, and、um, I I know that David, you mentioned at some point、um, that you always knew at some point that your calling in this lifetime involves community and involving stewardship for Jesus. And recently, I also just read somewhere that mysticism. Is about love. So let's start there and see where we're gonna go with that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. To me, that I always felt the the essence of mysticism was just devotion to God and devotion to love. And then when you give yourself over to that, then it shows itself. You know, it's not like a a form that you're trying to emulate or. A form that you're trying to make into an ideal that involves a certain appearance or certain rituals, but it's just purity of heart that Jesus talked about in the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. So to me, it's very simple, and that's why it's important to have some fun and be light with it. Because if it's too serious, then it's not really love. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, even the the title of this show. I remember when we were traveling many years ago.、Um, at that time, I had this feeling that a show wants to be born, and、um, I was asking you about a possible title or name for the show, and you just said, "Out of the blue comes Francis Zhu," <laughs> and we're just <laughs> laughing so hard in the airport with this name. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> a funny name that came, and that. Kind of set the tone, which you had many beautiful episodes of of that,、uh, and now here's a beautiful podcast coming with the, that name too. Yeah, and I do feel like for me, I really need to remember the purpose of doing anything, including setting up a podcast or anything. It's very easy to lose track of the purpose and start to get into a, a opposite direction. You know, with planning, with doing everything. So, I think this is the reason I pick to I pick this name again, even though it is a completely new format. It's a podcast. I feel this name will remind me that it is just about <laughs> having a a real joy, tap into the the present joy together. And in union too, you know,、yeah. together with my brothers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's exciting. Everything that seems to be loving and 
vibrant and full of energy is is really in the moment. So we can't really plan this life or this world, and I think that's that's part of the temptation of the the world and the ego to is to try to take something that's very vibrant and happy and put it on a timeline. And we've known, we've learned from artists and athletes and people from all walks of life, when they, they may be musicians, singers, but when it's just for the pure joy of the moment and it's coming through them, they're so happy and they feel like they're so full and it's so wonderful. And then as soon as they put it on the timeline, the ego says, okay, how are you going to make some money out of this? And how are you going to succeed? And how are you going to make a name for yourself and carve your niche out of the world? Then the joy is gone uh, as soon as that happens, because it's it's not the purpose to uh, to stick us to the timeline. It's actually to free us from a body identification and from a, a linear kind of personality self and personality world. It's the whole whole world that we're getting freed from. Yesterday, I mean, two days ago, we had a birthday dinner with our Living Miracles community members because mm -hmm. uh, one of the members, Marina, was celebrating her birthday. So we all went out and had dinner. And during the dinner, um, we started to talk about the microphone for today's show. And my mind just went straight away into oh, we need to figure out <laughs> the right <laughs> microphone. And as I was trying to, to get a solution in my mind, and I couldn't, everybody else was there helping. And I actually all of a sudden got ejected out from that state of mind. And I was watching the people around me talking. All of a sudden I feel... This, this real vision that they are so loving and they're so kind. Some people are talking about a specific thing. Some people are just chatting with each other about the food. But I suddenly see they're all just speaking the language of love through whatever specifics they're talking and then Ken is on my left and Eric on my right. They were talking to me. And in that moment, all that I wanted to say them to, to, to say to mm. them was, you're so kind. You're so kind. But it was so inappropriate to say <laughs> that because <laughs> we were talking about very specific mm. things. And I feel, you know, that movie um, Source Code at the end when he went back to solve the problem for so many rounds and mm -hmm. in the end he just accepted things as they are and he had this vision where the whole train and the people in the train were just laughing in slow motion that was exactly what i saw everybody was loving each other with the most soft gentleness and care though they speak all kinds of things but they're like a, their eyes are sparkling with joy to each other and I was so touched in that moment just so touched and I feel that is the essence of doing anything in this world to be able to to truly see that and tap into that and this is the essence of mysticism this is the essence of spiritual awakening the essence of community yeah yeah it's almost like this the scene sometimes seems to slow down like you're watching something in slow motion. And I think it's just because the love and the appreciation is so high and so strong that you you just want to absorb every nuance and everything about it. And it's it's so beautiful because it's so complete. Everything feels whole and complete right there in that moment. And like Jesus says, everyone plays their part perfectly. You perceive that everyone is playing their part perfectly which is another way of saying nothing has to change, no word is out of place, no action, no movement is out of place. And uh, always reminds me of the setting the goal section where you're just in it and you're watching it and you're thinking, oh, thank you, I'm so full of gratitude. Yeah, and that was also the most direct 
response to the other state of mind, the trying to figure out a technical issue in my mind, and yet the answer was so different, so drastically different from the problem. You you would think that the the peace comes from solving that problem, and then in that split second, the spirit offered an experience which is a direct answer to a problem you think you have. And that makes me think of what you sometimes say a lot. This path is not that difficult, but it is very different. It's very different yeah. than what you think. Yeah, yeah. I think it's because when we don't have any idea about perception, like that the world we're perceiving is coming from our mind, it is our mind, then it's easy to drift off into the default mode of, of the ego, which is focus on the body, focus on interpersonal relationships, and focus on the environment. So those are the three focuses of attention that draw you away from the moment. So the body is seen by the ego as the home. So it's it's seen as a place of, of good things and bad things, of of wonderful experiences and of problems. But the body is not the source or even the location of wonderful experiences or of painful experiences or of body symptoms or all the things that raise red alerts, you know, in terms of the human race. And then if you go a little bit past the body, you start to include some other bodies and then there's a construct called interpersonal relationships, which seem to be highly charged. Because the ego says you have to have certain bodies along with your special body to, to make you feel good enough and worthy enough. So you need special bodies that are in, in association with this body identity. And then a huge effort is placed on what people, whether they're smiling or they're frowning, or whether they're laughing or whether they're angry. And their their face is red or their faces, their eyes are sparkly. You know, it's a, it's a huge thing because of this dependence on the body and interpersonal relationships for a feeling of worth and goodness. And then the environment that's outside of the bodies will say, how is that immediate environment and how is that more generalized environment? Is it is it hostile? Is it uh, welcoming? Is it uh, in order or is it chaotic? Is it uh, at peace or is it at war? And the environment is never at peace or war. It's always the state of mind seemingly projected outward when the mind can't grasp the vastness of this moment and the true identity of the Christ, then it seems to either repress and deny or it projects a world tricking itself like it can get rid of the problem of separation by seeing it in people, in the body, and in the environment. So once you start to see the, that this is the whole trick and you start to realize that you can just relax and really come into the stillness and behold that it's all orchestrated perfectly, that it's nothing has ever been out of, out of line. Uh, no one ever spoke a wrong word. No one ever uh, gave a, an angry look. No one ever gave a, a happy look that really meant anything in the overall aspect of everything. I mean, smiles and, and sparkly eyes are nice reflections, and the Spirit does use those reflections to help us, you know, open up to the moment. But but in the end, the mystical experience sees everything from the perspective of, of love or happiness or joy. And that's what we're talking about. You know, it's it's not about trying to form an external community. It's not about trying to form or maintain external relationships. And it's certainly not even about trying to form or maintain an external body, because the whole experience is that everything is in mind, and there's nothing outside of mind. So that gives us a whole new context for even spiritual community. Is just, it's just a reflection of the miracle, and the miracle is where 
we feel that connectedness. Uh, we literally feel it. And then we, we aren't judging the form at all because the means and end are not apart. You know, if we're in the miracle, then we experience mystical community. We experience happiness, joy. We're not waiting for the form to change or evolve or grow more uh, aware. You know, it's, it's right here and right now in, in the moment. Can you talk a little bit about the essence of a mystical community? What is, what is the goal that people come together to, um, to get connected to this divine love? To me, mystical community is just another word for describing the communion experience of feeling connected with God and connected with love, being love. And then everything that's perceived from that forgiven world or that happy dream experience is, you can call it whatever you want. You could call it mystical community, you could call it uh, loving friendship, you could call it uh, God is good and everything is blessed by the goodness of God. You know, you could say it in many ways, but, but it's not seen as an external objective thing that's apart from awareness. Because as soon as you objectify it, then you can get into all kinds of things of what's a good community versus a bad community, what's, what are helpful rituals and what are harmful rituals. And, and you know, then it's really on the same parameters as the world. Mm -hmm. It's no different than talking about an economic system or a financial system or a psychological system system as if it has to be maintained outside of the mind and it doesn't yeah it isn't yeah in 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 this um path you know it feels like okay the spiritual community or mystical community is is a chosen path or a chosen curriculum for for myself and mm -hmm. for a lot of other people and for you and i was reading the guidelines when you first set up the awakening mind community it there is nothing about what you should do it was about basically what what is a, a state and that is interesting because that there is no practical um how to say guidelines in terms of what you should do in the community is generosity is one of the guidelines. Um, there's no reward in this world, no private thoughts, no people pleasing, no control over the world. Those are the guidelines. Yeah, <laughs> I was yeah. reading it and thinking there is nothing about how the community should function together or what you should be doing and this all about non-doing in in your guideline and i was curious when i read it, it was like how do you how do you know it was gonna work <laughs> <It's that kind laughs> of guideline. well i think it's it's more that, that that it was such a given experience and it was so guided from the spirit like you know there was a, these group of um guidelines given by the Holy Spirit, and so I wrote them down. And then out of that, a couple came to be known more popular. Just like there's Ten Commandments, and Jesus said, the first two are the most important ones. <laughs> love God with all thy heart, soul, and might, and love thy neighbor as thyself. With ours, we had, you know, a group of them, and like around ten, and then it got boiled down to no private thoughts and no people-pleasing, which... My friend Nasheen in China said was similar to nothing real can be threatened, nothing unreal exists. And then for some that was too mysterious, like no private thoughts and no people pleasing. Like when you first heard that, it was a bit, there was a bit of fear that came up because it can be very ambiguous. Like, well, that's, what does that even mean? Like, uh, what will that mean to me as a person? Or, you know, what will I have to do? Bear my soul and bear my thoughts. But I think actually those 10 
guidelines from the Holy Spirit actually are quite mirrored by the ten characteristics of a teacher of God that Jesus has in the manual for teachers, starting off with trust and honesty, and then you roll into the others, you know, patience and generosity, and ending with open-mindedness. But open-mindedness would welcome all brothers and sisters, regardless of what they think, say, do, believe. That is going beyond the, the traditional ideas of trying to find a community of like-mindedness or vibrational harmony, where you start to have the goal of seeing the whole world is, is your mind and the whole world is your community, because the world's not outside of your mind. But this is a practical way of doing it because you have to have experiences and it has to be fun and it has to be joyful and you have to feel the collaboration and you actually, it's not some kind of intellectual endeavor or a set of concepts, you have to actually feel it. The vibrancy has to be there because if the vibrancy isn't there, then, then what's the point? I mean, why would you do anything if you weren't feeling vibrant and joyful and connected. So to me, that's ultimately how it comes around, where we have these guidelines and we can see all kinds of parallels, you know, in terms of the, the course. But it was never about trying to establish a community as the world defines mm -hmm. community, which involves people, it involves properties, it involves management and control it it involves uh, it involves maintenance uh, and I was more interested in zero gravity zero maintenance uh, <laughs> happiness and joy than I was into forming a specific community and besides if you start to see everything and everyone is your spiritual community because it's all a reflection of your mind then what's gone abandonment rejection, inclusion, exclusion, all the things that have been struggles for the human race. Mm -hmm. uh, judging against your brother and sister, thinking somebody's in, somebody's out, you know, drawing a circle, drawing a line, that's no fun. You can't really be happy if you're making these artificial borders and then you're saying, don't cross that line and, and you're out and you're in, because that's the drama of, of the human race. And it's also the drama in interpersonal relationships. Who's together, who's not together. And even in terms of the body, is it a healthy body or an ill body? You know, it can't end there. How, how could we ever be satisfied with those kind of artificial distinctions when we don't have to think like that anymore? We, we can think with God. We can think with Christ. We don't have to fool around with this uh, duality stuff anymore because the ego is just all dualistic. I'm curious, though, because this is so different. And when it comes down to practical, every single, everyday living, um, money involves, involves money, involves mem like people coming in, people going out, and um, and yet the practical guideline is no ownership, no possession, no control over the world, no private thoughts, no people pleasing. At what point um, when you started to guide the community or you have founded Living Miracles community, maybe even some before that, at what point you just know for absolute certainty this is going to work? Because I know even right now when when people um, still feel fear to let out their emotion, part of the reason is that they don't have the confidence to let it out is going to um, transcend. That, w that there is another end. And even though we're not there yet, it, there is another end. And I think for myself, being in the community and um allowing the emotions to come up for myself and watching everybody allowing that there is definitely a confidence built up. You just know, I know it will come to the other side and there is nothing to fear in the process. But for example, sharing, 
this is a drastically different concept than what everybody operates, how everybody operates in this world. And to have that kind of confidence to say, this is okay, and this is not only okay, it's actually essential. Yeah, I want to hear you talk about it. Yeah, I think, well, again, it, for me, it starts and stops. It, it all is part of experience. So for me, you know, immersing in the course and using it as an oracle for for the first two and a half years, and then those first five years with the course were, were really me testing it out, like saying, okay, how, how willing am I to go with this uh, new approach? And how willing am I to commit my life to it? And that's the time of faith at the beginning, because, yeah, you're not sure, and you just are, are testing it out and just seeing every day, is this going to work, is this going to work, am I really going to be able to do this? So for me, that was important at the beginning. And then I'd say those five years when Jesus took me on walkabout and drive about around the United States, that was the telling experiment right there because I didn't have any kind of organizational support and there was no bank accounts, there was no uh, credit cards. It was like every single day just showing up and seeing, okay, all right, Jesus, you said you'd take care of me. I'll give it I'll give it a try. I don't know if this will work, but I'll give it a try. And then when it happens, miracles and miracles every day, then you're convinced. You know, it's like you actually are convinced that that there's a way beyond all the ways of the world, beyond everything that you've learned that actually works. And then it works every day. And then it works, you see, every hour of every day. And then you start to see at some point it, it works without exception. So then you start to realize what Jesus says is that ideas are strengthened as they're given away. That in this world, you know, sharing involves loss. If you share a million dollars then with somebody, then you have a half a million and they have a half a million. So sharing is associated with loss. And once you start to see, you know, to have, give all to all, and you really start to actually practice what Jesus is talking about, then you actually get convinced that it's real. That it's not a world of scarcity, that you are mistaken about the scarcity. Even though you had years, decades, usually of conditioning of supply and demand, which I took in university, you have it with mom and dad giving you an allowance and saying, I'm not going to give you your allowance unless you, you know, do the dishes and make your bed and, and do your chores. You know, you have years of reciprocity, and then you have education reciprocity, financial reciprocity, relationship reciprocity, and then Jesus comes along and says, yeah, none of that is valid. I, I have to, you have to trust me to show you a whole new way to live. And I did. And then when I began traveling and everything was taken care of, you know, without my effort uh, for so many years, you know, they went day in, day out, every hour, every moment, for year after year, then I was convinced. So at that point, then I my mind was open to guidance. And you might say that setting up the community or the way I would live my life was based on that guidance. And you and I have been through many of those miracles where things just showed up. Everything, transportation showed up, food showed up, houses showed up, uh, anything that was needed. You know, we had stories, I think there was one time when Jackie and Kirsten were driving and they saw their vehicle was running out of gas and a, uh, an entire gas station sh seems to materialize uh, that wasn't there before. Uh, it just shows you how it works. It's all just reflections of the mind. So doing that, then you're not going into it thinking about, okay, I'm going to build a community, I'm going to need people, I'm going to need money, I'm going to need places for people to stay and interact. You don't, you don't think that way. It, it, it would be like making a garden and you just, you get a seed from Jesus and then you just stick the seed in the ground and then you just trust that 
it's going to grow without any effort or maintenance. And then, of course, down in Mexico, that's pretty much how it goes. In Hawaii, where we live, you know, it just kind of sprouts up and it does it. You know, you don't make it grow. You don't make it happen. You just behold the beautiful plant or the beautiful flower or vegetable. And that's kind of the way that it went. I had to be convinced first. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I was convinced, then the world was a playground. Somebody doesn't pay you the money that they owe you. Oh well, must not need it. Somebody doesn't keep their word. Oh well, they're not supposed to, uh, I'm not going to hold them to it because that would be holding them to the past. I want to see who they really are. I want to see their light. I want to see the Christ. I don't want to have a bunch of expectations. And so then you start to follow the guidance every day without exception and then it feels more like a, a dance, like everything is a dance and not this kind of concrete thing that we've believed was there that you're supposed to study and figure out and analyze and fix. It's just not that at all. It never was that mm -hmm. for me. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's actually fun. It's a fun way to live because you don't take it seriously. You know, you, you're, it's like that movie we watched a while back, a couple of months ago, uh, Shakespeare. All is well, I think, or something like that. And, and of course, he, he was a, just had a great gift. He shared that gift very freely. He was paid very well, very handsomely for that gift. He, he had actors, actresses, you know, Play, he was a playwright, but he had people playing it out. He even had his own theater, uh, the Globe Theater, and then it all burned to the ground. And then he had to really just face what was in his mind, where, what his motion was. He went back to a wife that he hardly had seen in years, to, to children, to daughters that he had hardly seen. And ultimately, that's how forgiveness works. Whatever we seem to make in the world whatever image we make of ourself, it doesn't matter. Uh, at some point, we have to face the contents of our consciousness. We have to face our feelings and thoughts. It, you know, we don't get a free pass to heaven until we allow the Spirit to use those thoughts and those feelings and those beliefs and, and clear our mind of these idols that we've made to take the place of God and, and love. And so we're doing that now. That's that's what this is about. That's what every moment is is about that. That's important, I think. I I feel like when I was being convinced, it was because that was so important to me. Mm -hmm. Actual peace of mind, not some book, mm -hmm. not some theology, not some external concept or external relationship, but actual state of mind. That's really important to me and mm -hmm. that's that's what got me into everything that seems to be. So with the community right now, do you do you see the community and the members or together with, of course, seemingly people who just ha you encounter every day that doesn't necessarily live uh, in the community, do you see them as no real work to do in a way? There is no real um, awakening except is you holding the purpose and that and as long as that is there everything is done yeah yeah that's how i feel i, I mean there was a course in miracles teacher years ago that i adored named tara singh and i was watching him one time on a video and he had a big smile on his face and twinkly eyes and he said three words life takes care hmm. and i just relaxed i just said life takes care uh, that's just kind of uh, like Byron Katie's love what is life takes care you know it, it's like it's it's out of our our hands in one sense all we have to do is behold it and appreciate it for like you were doing at the birthday party when you had a thought about a, a microphone and then suddenly it was all getting handled without any personal uh, fixing or personal investment and I think once we allow that to travel, transfer to everything in our mind, then then that takes the organizational 
component out of it. Because most people would say, whether you're talking about the body, or the relationship, or your environment, or any relationship, there's, a, there's an element of organization and, uh, and there's an element of um, maintenance involved. And nobody likes that. Nobody likes the maintenance, you know, I just want to be happy and free, I don't want to have to maintain something. And Jesus is like, yeah, you don't. Uh, <laughs> stay with me in this moment and I'll, sh I'll show you that everything is perfect as is and always has been and always will be. So for me, I see it's about communication, actually. I mm -hmm. see that, that for those that seem to be really drawn to and involved with the community, mm -hmm. they're really drawn to open, free, direct, clear communication. That's what lights them up. And to be fully in communication, I think that's just the holy instant, where you're in communication with everyone and everything in all of history, mm -hmm. uh, so to speak. You know, not, not that there's a real history, but you feel mm -hmm. like you're connected with everything and everyone because you have nothing you would hide and nothing you would keep separate, nothing you would keep private. And if you really just took those two guidelines, no private thoughts and no people pleasing, and you really applied that to everything, then you would see there's no private bodies, there's no private relationships, there's no private communities, there's no private finances, uh, there's no private concepts. You actually would see that everything must come undone in that full communication and that true love and generosity. And and you're okay with that. What's going to be lost? Nothing. What does it cost me? Nothing. <laughs> Are you saying it's totally free? Yes. Like free will doesn't mean choice in form. Free will is happiness. That's what Jesus says. God's will for you is perfect happiness. So once you start to feel that there's no loss involved, then What's wrong with that? You know, who who could not uh, accept and embrace that happiness and joy? It's just that the ego is like a mesmerism of false concepts and ideas. And every day, every week, I just enjoy the experience of seeing that exposed and and I mean, it's it's just it's like it's falling apart. But for me, it's really all integrating. You know, the whole perception is that nothing really being lost or falling apart. I remember Jesus says in A Course in Miracles, um, salvation, or I can't use the word salvation, atonement, is total perfect com communion with God. and Or you can say that's the only function of the mind. And yet, body is, bodies are symbols the ego made. So how he he actually posed a question there? How can the symbol of fear um, help with communication? It's like bodies, the the mouths talking to each other. This is not communication. If anything, the body is made to stop communication and it has no function whatsoever. But if you allow the body to be used for the communication that spirit guides you, then at least you're not using the body for the ego. And really, ultimately, that's the only thing that you can use the body for. To use the body as a communication tool, as guided by the spirit. That's the only way that the body is not serving the ego's function. There's absolutely no way, because it was created to block the communication. So that was very eye-opening to think oh my God, even communication with people, let's not fool ourselves to think we know what communication even is. And I see in um, this book, um, Mutant, Mutant Message Down Under, um, Marla Morgan talked about her experience in this Australian Aboriginal tribe. And they communicate telepathically completely in mind. It just shows that even in this world, if you don't use the body to block communication, which is, you know, communication about the ego thoughts or um, ego motives and purpose, 
then the mind can truly just be open to receive. Because in that tribe, um, people communicate with each other telepathically in very very specific terms. I'm two hundred. I'm two kilometers away. I found a kangaroo. Um, it's very big. Is this this big? You need. We need three people here in this direction. That's all communicated very very specifically telepathically, and they told、um, Marlon Morgan that the only reason that you can't do it is because there are too many private thoughts. You you there's too much fear to openly. Give and receive information,、uh, or openly receive and give thoughts. There are too many protections and pri-、um, private thoughts. And another thing is also, I remember an example when this, when they're having some kind of group activity, and she was suggesting to the group we can do a race and see who is the fastest and who is. Have a little competition, and they could not understand how that can be fun. Why would you have a competition with your brother? And how can someone winning and someone losing be of any value and have anything to do with fun? And they were like so completely,、um, they're not able to understand that concept. So with with that, I. Can think, yeah. Competition, comparison, such a normal way of thinking in this world, and because of that, partially because of that, and also many other ego concepts, there is a tendency to hide because you want your own something, and this hiding immediately blocks communication, true communication. Yeah, yeah. I think that's. When you even set out to shine your light and and use the symbols of the world, like even in terms of relationships or spiritual community, then the ego will try to draw the mind into a sense of aut- autonomy, personal autonomy, pride in skills, abilities,、uh, and then it will try to reinforce that false image with competition, comparison, all kinds of things. And then, the flip side: if if the mind won't go for that, like maybe it's like, no, I'm not. I just don't feel feel drawn to that at all. Then there's a, the flip side is like an enmeshment, where it's like lose yourself in the group. They talk, sometimes call it herd mentality,、mm-hmm. where you just go along with everything that people tell you and everything people want you to do. You, it's kind of like the beginning of that、uh, that. Movie Yes Man. First he says no to everything, then he flips and says yes to everything, which gets him out of the no. But then he flips into this enmeshment where his girlfriend finally she just is like, "You've been lying to me. You you aren't really telling me what you truly feel. You're just saying yes to everything I say and going along." So. That sense of enmeshment brings with a sense of enabling and codependency, and it's it's just as destructive as the autonomy. I don't need anybody else. I can do it all on my own. I'm my own person, and you know, both of them are way off from the truth, from the miracle. And then Jesus talked about the miracle, and Buddha talked about the middle way, and. And some people talked about it in form, like do everything in moderation. But it's not really about trying to adjust based、mm-hmm. on behavior and form. It's a state of mind, and it takes a lot of trust to be in that state of mind consistently. Because if you don't have that trust and that faith in that in the present moment, then you can get lured out into all these ego tricks and trips, you know, which. Which really aren't aren't happy at all. You know, they always they may give a little pseudo happiness, like you think you're getting something or attaining something, and then you find you're holding an empty bag、uh, that you've been tricked once again. So that's why I feel like it takes a lot of devotion to really hang with this, and the mind can be lured off into all kinds of temptations. But this is just the temptation to make illusions real, or to 
try to prefer one thing over another or or be better than somebody else and you know it's really draining actually mm -hmm. at some point the mind goes this i'm not going to go for this i i want to be a miracle worker i want to know my true happiness here i'm not going to get fooled mm -hmm. but actually you have to allow the spirit to use all the symbols including the body the words uh and and the environment you have to let it all be used by the holy spirit to bring the mind to this unified state of mind you can't just push away and say oh watching movies is bad or mm -hmm. eating this food is bad or mm -hmm. i won't ever go to this place because it's mm -hmm. bad bad environment or bad vibes you know I, people used to tell me in the early years you know oh this this person has good vibes and this one has bad vibes and i would used to say i can't let that um determine where i go and what i do i mean i actually was guided to the very places where people along the road the route would say oh don't go there it's a waste of time they're just totally misusing the course or they're misusing this and that and then i would just get quiet and jesus says you're going and then i would follow and i would go in trust and joy and i had a wonderful experience even though people were telling me to avoid this person or this place i had a wonderful experience because i showed up with jesus with with the spark of love in in my heart to give that away and if that's what you're going to give away then why would you shy away from anything or anyone you know the bible says if if god is with us who can be against us mm -hmm. that's so practical that's just so good uh, of advice to follow so to me that it, it it does lead you into a much broader experience that's not so locked into trying to avoid certain things or trying to be attracted to certain things and ones mm -hmm. when it, the spirit can use that but but ultimately it's it's not the final happiness the happiness is is total acceptance and no judgment do you feel like when you were traveling on your own that five years because you were you didn't have a community at the time everywhere you traveled you were meeting brand new people you never met and and just go wherever and then for many many years people come around and want to be in a community together and it it hasn't really stopped that kind of form is there a difference in actual practice being alone and being with a large group of people living 24/7 together i think not so much not in actual practice mm -hmm. i mean when you're working with a community and it seems to be like a reflection of a very deep purpose shared purpose and vibrational connection it feels experientially very uh wonderful uh but then the whole point of that wonderful feeling is to make no exceptions mm -hmm. you know to it mm -hmm. so that it like the jesus says at the beginning of the workbook so it's a transferring to everyone and everything that you perceive you know that's that's the ultimate part of what spiritual awakening is all about mm -hmm. but you have to follow the trail the breadcrumbs of what feels vibrationally resonant and and connecting so for me that's that's what it's been you know when you just shine your light and you're happy and you share if people are drawn to that then so be it mm -hmm. um that's just part of the mm -hmm. plan even that doesn't set up any kind of dependencies because it's based on principle it's based on essence it's not based on form and ritual and inclusive rules and exclusive rules you know mm -hmm. that's so typical of the ego you just making rules for everything this is is very very joyful and it's it's a state of mind it's a state of your your heart so it's very natural in that way so i wouldn't tell people don't try to go after goals in the world and even there are some very well-intentioned people that are wanting to set up ecosystems and uh communities that share food and this and that while keeping a lot of individual autonomy for individuals and families and people are just going to to do what they believe they can do 
But ultimately, I think for myself, I saw that that really wasn't what I wanted to pursue. I, I wanted to shine the light, and I trusted that everything that would flow from that mm -hmm. would be with the community, mm -hmm. the, the spiritual family. The same with Paramahansa Yogananda. All the Ananda communities all over the world are very loving, devotional communities. To me, that's just a reflection of of that love mm. that's there. And and we've talked about with Thomas Merton and and Father Thomas Keating and and other mystics and saints, you know, it was more the essence of the love that was what the mysticism was about. And then what seemed to be around them was I call it symbols of that love and devotion. Mm. And so it's not set up to have codependencies mm. or any kind of dependencies. It's just just shine the light of God. I remember many years ago, I had this realization, maybe during one of the gatherings, I just had this profound realization that I'm so glad that you, um, you, knew, what love, uh, you knew what love was. Because I didn't. Mm. I realized I got on this spiritual journey with, with a little glimpse, but mainly because just had enough of the suffering and then jump into A Course in Miracles very much through the, the way I thought a study would um, entail books, studies, and want to achieve the end, the, the Mount Everest of spiritual awakening. I want to get to the top. But, but then there was a moment when I came to the community and maybe a, actually a couple of years in it, I realized you were completely guided by love and nothing else, not absolutely nothing else. And you knew it and you live in it. That's what you radiate. And in that moment, I felt so comforted, just like, oh my God, I'm so happy. That's, that's what you are. That's what you follow. And that was the same experience when I read uh, autobiogra the autobiography of a yogi. Because when um, Yogananda, all he wanted and his calling as a little boy was to know that love and to have that direct union. And then somehow there is uncontainable um, calling to actually reach out or have this light shine. And then, of course, there is um, a response wanting to follow that same love and wanting drawn to be together to to be in that state of mind that's which is very very appealing and i see that in a lot of the mystics and saints even though they could very well live in the hermit and have this direct union with god that's all they ever wanted um, and yet somehow there is just this love and light that is uncontainable they have to reach out because this is part of the union. Part of the union. Because, you know, that's coming back to what I said at the very beginning. Mysticism is about love and love is actually about communion. It's about union. So I really see that as just a calling. Somehow you can't explain it. Yeah, yeah. It is involuntary. I think it's it's like it has to be where it takes you from what you think you already know into a state where you see you know nothing of this world and, and you're happy. You know, you're you're clueless and carefree and cared for and and you have to, to go for it and go into the experience and then as you're in the experience you, you have this happy relief and it's like, Oh, this is the most natural uh, experience ever and then you're just carried and then for me when I look at the mystics and saints the lives of the different mystics and saints I, there's so much recognition like when I started to just hear bits and pieces about Yogananda Paramahansa Yogananda then I, I just so much had happened in my life and there were so many parallels that I just kind of had a chuckle or a laugh like oh my gosh this is like this is my life but it was about six decades, you know, he was doing it, leaving his familiar, comfortable, happy life in, in India 
with his, a school, establishing schools and doing all these things to totally being lifted out of that and coming to the United States and traveling and speaking, which I did the same thing. And I was lifted out of yeah my simple little life in the United States to into, you know, travel all over the United States and then Canada, then all over the world. Uh, so for me, it was like Yogananda, except he mainly came to the West, to the United States. I, I was taken out to a global uh, theater, which I knew nothing of. I didn't speak the languages. I, I didn't, for years, I didn't use airplanes and transportation. I, I, I rode a bike. Uh, I mean, I, I just was, it was uh, totally unfamiliar to me. But that's how it works, you know, to take you out of the seeming known of the past and take you into a, an expanded state of mind where you feel love and connection with all your brothers and sisters. And then also later on, you know, because what, like I got going in the 80s and really uh, Yogananda was going in the 20s there in the United States. So it was about six decades difference. But then some of the same thing that started to happen because the ego is so clever that, you know, after all that travel, he goes to Mount Washington and California and a beautiful house and the people gather around him and everything. And then when he's off traveling, uh, things fall apart. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened to me when I started traveling. I, I would travel, I'd be in a relationship, I'd go off on a travel and the relationship changed while I was gone traveling, just like Paramahansa Yogananda. I'm like, I could feel it, and I think he could feel it. But when, you know, the devotees and the, everything starts to divide, and, you know, his whole uh, ministry of these beautiful, uh, they were like yogis, it's a ministry of yogis with this beautiful teaching of love, uh, started to get hit. The ego just was trying to sabotage everything, and he became so disillusioned that he... Finally, uh, he just went to Mexico to kind of pray and pray and pray and regroup. I saw that too in with different things around community. And so, again, I had to smile like it's the same thing. Like it's the state of mind. And as, as long as you associate it with bodies, with a, an earthly ministry, with uh, anything in form, it's not it. Because uh, Jesus teaches in the Beyond All Idols section of, of the Course, God knows not form. Mm -hmm. So if I want to know God and God knows not form, that's a clue uh, that this is not about the form of things. They can be nice reflections and symbols when they're used in harmony with the Holy Spirit, but it's not a final, there's no finality to anything in form because the first lesson, nothing I see means anything. It's it's a projection of of an unreal thought called ego, an unreal belief. So I like that. I actually like liked reading about the mystics and saints, reading Marla Morgan's book, Mutant Message Down Under, learning about telepathic community, reading about different uh, Sri Aurobindo and all the different, uh, Joel Goldsmith and Mary Baker Eddy, you know, whether they were Christian mystics or whether they were mystics from the East, I enjoyed that because that's the story of my mind. It was just saving me time seeing that I didn't have to get locked into these things in form. And I think that's the thing with the Course. It's so deep that, you know, the ego is so threatened by the Course that it will try to make a career out of it, it will try to make a movement out of it, it will try to blend it, the the presence with other forms, even though the teachings of the Course, you know, Jesus even says in the Course, this Course has everything that you need. I took that literally. Mm -hmm. I mean, I I was reading a lot and I was studying a lot of different things. I was kind of a mm -hmm. student of world... Uh, religions and spiritualities and philosophies. But when the Course came and Jesus said, this Course has everything that you need, I thought, this is from the Master. I'm here to save time. I'm here to have an experience of love. I'm not here to get caught up into comparing and contrasting and trying to make mm -hmm. some kind of synthetic world religion. Uh, even Gandhi was tempted <laughs> to try to synthesize the world religions, even though he grew up in Hinduism. Uh, he was drawn to so many, he, he became more open. But I could even see past that trick. 
Like I don't, world doesn't need a synthetic theology of blend of, of other ones. We need to have an experience of actual love, of actual forgiveness. And that's why I, d I do not try to blend my so-called spiritual calling with, uh, with what other people are saying, oh, you have to try this, you have to do this. I've, got, I've been there, done that. Uh, I, I'm content in the moment. I'm not leaving this moment because there's no <laughs> nowhere else to go. There is a focus and trust to actually choose nothing else because when you choose the moment, the present joy, you do have to leave everything behind, so to speak. I just remember when we first went to China and the second time when we went, um, this organizer for us, somehow the, the, the audience or the, the students there really didn't like them. And they said, if, if these are these two people are the organizer, we wouldn't come. And so I was in a lot of communication with them and I, I, I was a bit concerned. So I went to you and said, David, there is a problem and they're really not popular and people are threatening not to come if we keep collaborating with them. And you just said, I'm going there to love them. I'm going there in terms of the two organizers. Mm -hmm. You said, I am just going there to have a connection with them. Nothing else. There's no concern of how many people come, whether people would come at all. That's not a concern. It was just holding on to something so clear. And that was a very deep teaching for me in that moment because it was practical and it was, I can see my thinking was in the other realm. So when you said that to me, even just so lightly, you were in the passing, just say, oh, no, I'm, I'm just going there to connect. I'm going for the heart connection with these two. And I feel this, this is the kind of things, the vigilance that... I feel like this world is calling for because it's so easy to get lost. In, and those moments are the, the, the practical applications. This, those moments are the opportunity to choose one or the other and strengthen one or the other in our mind. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I find that, that true love, it's so vibrant and, and so expansive, but it's, it's not political. So it, it, love doesn't choose between this movement or that movement or this person or that po person, it, that was too small. It, love is so vast. And from my perspective, I mean, we went to China seven times, but this was one of those rare times when we were in China where we actually had two people offering to organize events for us, organize a van for us to travel between Shanghai and Beijing, organized setting things up, I was absolutely delighted. To me, that's just a symbol of the Holy Spirit uh, throwing a blessing. Jesus saying, here, I'm going to throw a couple beloveds to to help you shine your light. And I was like, oh, great, thank you. I'm, I'm, I just was full of appreciation. And then when people were starting to, you know, say they, they didn't like these two and, you know, and they didn't trust them or they, they didn't, they wouldn't even come if they were involved, I'm like, well, everyone's invited to the party, uh, and you can choose to come or not come. That's okay. That's great. Uh, I'm going to show up and shine my light. But that I saw that as these are primary collaborative relationships that Jesus gives us, and it's for joy. It's to spread the joy. This is not about taking sides. And that's why I, I, I see that it's not that I choose or don't choose to be involved in politics, but I've already transcended the construct of, of politics, because politics is a very time-oriented uh, construct. You know, who's voting for who and what they stand for. Yes, if you want to talk about ideas, that's great. I'll sit down and talk with anybody about ideas. I would talk to politicians about the ideas, uh, because... Ideas and sharing ideas is, is important, and I think that's beautiful. But the idea of taking stands for or against people or for or against issues, to me, is just a common ego distraction from being loving. Mm -hmm. 
and seeing the world in an all-inclusive, all-encompassing way, which Jesus is a great example of that. He wasn't a demonstration of, he wasn't political. No. <laughs> Even though back in the day there was all the same temptations, you know, Jews and Gentiles and Romans and Sadducees and Pharisees and Zealots and he was so bright that he didn't buy into any of it, mm. and not for one instant. <laughs> and all sides love him. <laughs> <laughs> <That's right. laughs> Because love is not in the group. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He, they could feel the genuineness that, that was there. But I think Jesus, is to, back then, he would be seen kind of as a rebel, because even though he was seemingly coming from a Jewish family, he was not so identified with the Jews or the Romans or or any particular uh, group. Um, his teachings were about the kingdom of heaven, mm -hmm. which is really about reaching the present moment. Mm -hmm. So you can see how, it, in one sense, he knew of these concepts, but he, he didn't play into them. He didn't uh, take sides or or try to throw. He wasn't bent on throwing the Romans out of Galilee as much as he was forgiving everyone and everything and, and seeing the light of truth. <laughs> yeah. Sparkly. <laughs> yeah. So in a way that we're following the teachings of the Course, but but truly in practicality, every day we're following that that love that um, that we will feel if something is truly through forgiveness, then we can feel that love and that joy. And that is the actually the light that's guiding us. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the Course came to me, and so I took it as, as a pathway to follow, and I have followed it. And then I had a lot of prayer and discernment with Jesus along the way to get clear on the teachings and the metaphysics, but more than that, on the practical application of it and the experience. So I took the path. It was, it's been a joyful path. But the final uh, characteristic of a teacher of God is open-mindedness. So uh, there was a time when Judy Scutch, in one of the dinners or lunches we were having, was saying, you know, in a hundred years, A Course in Miracles will be unrecognizable. And you were joking the other day when I told you, you said, well, over 50 years is gone. <laughs> and I said, yeah, it's, it's, and it's, it's already, everything's blending into the experience of love. So now, with our new like, online community with Tribe that will have 25 major languages as an instant one-button uh, mm -hmm. translation, with the the music, the movies, the podcast, the the dances, the joyful celebrations that we have, you know, that's love is content mm -hmm. and not form of any kind. You know, we're not meant to make distinctions and judgments on form. We're meant to love, mm -hmm. and really to, to love from our heart, which is very inclusive. Love is all-inclusive. Since God is all-inclusive, so is love. So to me, this is a very exciting extension of this moment where we're here into having the experience through inspiration, through joyful, you know, radiant vibration it's that's what it's all about and i do feel like there will be those that seem to hear this call and say i want what they're experiencing <laughs> you know because they sense they feel it maybe mm -hmm. more so than the words they mm -hmm. could feel it in in our our demonstration our in, in our tone of voice our lightness our happiness our laughter our fun uh that that children are drawn to fun Naturally, if there's a group of people and some are doing something that's spontaneous, the kids will go right over there and, and jump right in and participate. So this is, I see it as sweeping the whole world. Uh, I've never seen this as anything that's kind of a, a local mm -hmm. phenomenon. I see this as a universal phenomenon. Normally people don't associate mysticism with fun. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah, we're. I'm happy to be a part of the, the witnesses that it is fun. Yeah, Love and fun actually are synonymous. Yeah, I think the old days of traditional mysticism, because the ego was like the predominant 
force of the world and people said it's it's boring it's it's very serious uh it's kind of stuffy and it's it's very eccentric you know they they thought that monks and nuns lived like very eccentric kind of lives i would say simple is is a better word they're into the simple devoted joy and they're not so interested in the things of the world. A few of them got drawn, like Merton got drawn a little bit into the, it was during the anti-war movements and Vietnam and everything, and they were tempted and he did some writings about peace, but it was always peace as opposed to war or something. Mm -hmm. And Jesus is showing, when you have peace in your heart, the whole world is peaceful. Mm -hmm. You're, you shift your perception of the world. You're not anti-government or anti this country or that country or anti-leader, you actually are pro-peace. And I love Mother Teresa one time when they asked Mother Teresa if she would come and she would participate in an anti-war rally. And she said, no. And they were shocked. <laughs> and they were like, Mother Teresa, what, what? She said, no, if you will call it a pro-peace rally, mm. um, I will come. Mm. She had her orientation right. She was not anti anything. Mm -hmm. You know, she was pro peace, mm -hmm. which is pro Jesus, which is pro God. You can't go wrong with that. Not we're saying that there's the theology of Jesus and you know penance and sacrifice and you know there's been many distortions mm -hmm. of of Jesus's teachings. We're not saying you should just accept all those blindly, mm -hmm. but but accept the essence of the teachings of forgiveness and love and rejoice together in that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that makes me feel so, just so grateful for all the um, message that I actually penetrating through the ego's <laughs> <laughs> filter and still come to this realm and to be received in, in this very tangible way that it is about love and it is very achievable even in this world through forgiveness. But there are so many examples and so many um, way showers along the way that kind of radiate that essence and touch us, you know, just by their pure being. Yeah, yeah. I love that. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of joy and and every day is to be a hallelujah. You know, like, I love that word hallelujah. I mean, it's it's so joyful, just the way you say the word hallelujah. <laughs> and then um, there's a song that I listen to on a playlist, kind of reminds me in the morning, a worship playlist, but uh, it kind of comes all the way to the point to hallelujah even here. Mm -hmm. Meaning, even in what you perceive to be the world, there is a way of holistically looking at the world and, and being in that hallelujah. For many people, they say, wow, that seems so far away. We have a pandemic going on, they'll tell me. We have, we have racism, we have sexism, we have economic uh, unevenness, we have all these forces of darkness, uh, forces of evil that are going on. How do you have a hallelujah? Or as the song says, hallelujah, even here. <laughs> How do you bring that hallelujah into an authentic, real expression, mm. and, but by forgiving. Mm. Forgive the evil mm. and, and be in the hallelujah. Forgive the, all the things, you know, when people talk about problems of racism and sexism, of political struggles and financial struggles, poverty, uh, hunger, uh, nuclear proliferation, fear of war and all these things, I know, because I, I was involved in all that, actually. It's not like I just was trying to be an ostrich with my head in the sand. I actually was quite involved with a lot of it, and very active, seemingly, <laughs> as, as active as you can get in illusions. But they weren't illusions to me at the time. Mm -hmm. They were actually serious problems. But when you follow the Course, if you really fo follow Jesus, He's teaching us to forgive the world, forgive what we seem to do, forgive what others have done, and come into the present moment. All the perennial wisdom teachings teach about the present moment. 
And we're not trying to give some spiritual phraseology to those words and just say that there's power in the words present moment. We're saying, no, no, the words are not it. It's There's something much deeper that's actually the essence mm. of the present moment. Mm. It's gleeful, it's happy, it's joyful. And, and that's why Jesus could say, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Because he overcame Satan. He overcame ego. He overcame the devil. Mm. Wow, that is a hallelujah. And then he was so present, he had that presence so that anybody, even a woman, touches the hem of his garment from behind. And he says, who touched me? Mm. And, and, and then she's, her symptoms are gone. Just, and by, by your faith you are healed. That simple little encounter has so much in it, because here we have the Christ which is dominion over the world, and we have a little tiny mm -hmm. uh, willingness to to touch the hem of his garment. And then the healing is right there. Salvation has come in that presence. So, yeah, this is very sacred. This is, this is a very honored thing to be experienced. And for those that say, well, this is just denial. Well, we've had to face denial and repression, we've had to face projection, we've had to face these ego tricks that try to guard against God, and we're succeeding in coming into that experience. And we want to make a joyful noise unto the <laughs> Lord from that. You know, that's why we're doing a podcast. You know, we're making a joyful noise unto the Lord, you know. Yeah. yeah. Wow, that's so wonderful. It feels so bright and shiny, just that message. Yeah. It yeah. is. It is. It's a message of love, message of forgiveness. I do see that forgiveness as the means in this world that to have that reflection of love. So it's almost, these two are almost the same, even though they're not exactly the same, because one is in this realm of illusions and one is outside. Love is outside, but forgiveness is the, the mean and the reflection. So that's all that we need to do is to use these amazing, wonderful tools and just live in the message of love. Yeah. 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 It's all about the love. And, and for me, you know, I was very shy and, and I was at the beginning, kind of a quiet, timid, private person. And so Jesus was always, he was always wanting me to to freely give the love, mm -hmm. freely extend, freely radiate, and then, and then surprisingly to start to publish it to the world. So that's why we've used symbols of, we live in an age of, of the internet. So uh, unlike the early, early mystics and saints, there was no internet. So we publish it to the world. We make a joyful sound. We, I will break out singing. The Spirit does it through me. Or sh laughing, sharing. Did a, a, a long uh, Instagram live yesterday with uh, Juliana Kurokawa from uh, Brazil. And we just went on over an hour. And it was the first time I'd done anything like that. Mm -hmm. But it just was given. So if people are listening to our podcast here and they're saying, wow, I like the, I like the vibe there, I like the, the feel that's mm -hmm. coming through, then we should say, well, you know, for me, the last 25 years, the last quarter of a century, I've been publishing it to the world. So people really sometimes aren't aware of how it's freely available. Like Jesus taught me early on, you know, freely you have received, now freely give. Mm -hmm. So... It's just published all over the, the internet in in writing, in digital form, in audio form, in video form, in all kinds of podcasts and YouTubes and on and on and on and on. And and I, that's aside from seemingly doing it in person where you we did all these gatherings in all these countries and we shine and shine and share. So it's all there. Mm -hmm. uh, if anybody's saying, well, you went into the forest and you came out happy. Uh, I wish you had left a few breadcrumbs. Uh, they're sprinkled all over the place. You don't, you don't even have to look that that hard to find those breadcrumbs. And all you have to do is have the willingness to just 
see a few breadcrumbs and then open your heart and and feel the guidance inside you you wanting to to guide and lead and then then take it take the road less traveled i did yeah. i i can't you know say enough about you know <laughs> i was happy to take the road less traveled jesus in the bible is called the straight and narrow i'm happy to walk on that straight and narrow i'm not i didn't miss out on anything at all yeah well and that makes it very easy for for people like myself <laughs> and around you i could just watch i could watch the examples i could link up in mind and there's so many times during the 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 time that i live in the community i was like what we're we going to go that direction now what are you what is like but and yet every single time i realize this community everyday life everything every moment serves no other purpose than letting go letting go the what i already know what i think how i think i should plan who i think i am what is the future goal there is no other purpose than that and yeah just um, feeling so honored actually to <laughs> to be able to be living like this and to be able to have a shining example to um link up with yeah yeah it's it starts off people still have all kinds of questions and curiosities you know one thing i've been getting over the last maybe year or so uh as i talk to people we have a nice conversation and they they say where are you and then and then why are you in mexico that's like why are you in mexico and only thing that comes to mind is that at the end of the movie lucy you know with the little cell phone i am everywhere <laughs> i mean that's that's what comes to mind you know it's like it's like jesus said i'm calling you out of the world but he's calling us into a state of mind of i am everywhere and if i am everywhere then there's happiness with that there's no lack in that there's no wish to be somewhere else if you're everywhere you don't wish to be anywhere else because you are everywhere you see how practical this is but it's also a very highly trained state of mind and it comes from willingness it's not like from hard work it's actually some people could say well the spiritual journey is hard work but that's just from the personal perspective mm -hmm. it's actually easy jesus says is can god be reached directly he said uh, actually the only thing that's natural in this world is to reach god to know mm -hmm. god mm -hmm. everything else is unnatural but mm -hmm. to reach and know god is mm -hmm. the only he says you might even say it's the only natural thing in this world that flips everything around uh suddenly you know it's like why would be you be concerned about all anything specific when the whole point is to know your who you are and to know god and that is joyful I like that. I like that. I think there's also something I heard from you when I first came to the community. You said there is no mystery um uh, of God. This ego world is m mysterious because you can't figure it out. And that really also turned everything around. Okay, the only natural thing is to know God. There is no mystery in that. We don't have to say oh that is mysterious, that is a mystic um mystical in the sense that is unknown. No no this is the unknown this <laughs> this is mysterious this is unknowable and that is the only thing that is knowable yeah so I yeah. love that I know that that's pretty deep because sometimes people will say well yeah we just they, uh, make a phrase it's a divine mystery but but there is no such thing as a divine mystery god is openly revealed and and can be known in fact it's the only thing god is the only thing that can be known spirit will say so it's the world the my mysterious world of time and space the mysterious world of specifics mm. the mysterious world of false idols when the bible said make no have no graven images before the lord thy god it's the idols that are mysterious and in the end you know you don't want that mystery we watched the movie revolver and in the uh, the ego was called mr gold mr mysterious mhm mm the ego is mysterious and we're not into 
the mysteries. <laughs> We're into the actuality, yeah. self-actualization, as uh, Carl Rogers and uh, you know, Abraham Mesler taught us, self-actualization. That's so re relieving. That's where we truly don't have to figure out if we know it, it cannot be figured out anyways. So why? Yeah. And then just go directly to the experience of love. And that's such a gift. That is why we can say hallelujah even here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because we don't have to figure the world out. The world can be the unknown and then we can embrace the known. But that is not anything of this world. Mm. That's an experience that's yeah, beyond this world. Oh, thank you so much, <laughs> David. I'm just so so glad to uh, be able to spend this time with you. And any moment, just to have that kind of shining example that radiate love and care in absolutely every moment, it just it is such a blessing, such a blessing. So... Mm -hmm. I'm so honored to have you today, and I really hope that everybody who is listening enjoyed this as much as I did. Just yeah. love you so much, yeah. David. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> uh. oh, thank you, everyone, for listening in, and I hope to join you again next Thursday. Thursday.